if you don't what do these people know that you don't know they understand how listing on the Jamaica Stock Exchange can improve the profitability of their company. They know the potential for increasing the company's capital, the governance requirements, the tax responsibilities, the ownership implications, and the procedures for listing. They have the knowledge to make an informed decision on whether or not to go public. Knowledge is power. If you don't know, you can't act. Begin a conversation with the Jamaica Stock Exchange to gain the information you need to make a decision. I'm Stafford Burroughs, CEO of Dolphin Cove Limited, and we're listed on the junior markets of the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Call today to begin your conversation. Call 876-967-3271. The Jamaica Stock Exchange, transformations through conversations, making your life after business and work possible. <laughs> coming along well. <laughs> Thanks, man. You know, it's a long time I'll be working at it. I can see that. I saw you mail by the gate, uh, so I'll pick it up you. for you. But tell me something. Why are you still receiving dividend checks by mail? What do you mean about that? You need to give JCST a mandate. You know, me hear about the mandate then. I'm going over there right now. A mandate means giving instructions to the Jamaica Central Securities Depository Limited, JCST, relating to the handling of your dividend or interest payment. There are three types of mandates. The first is a bank mandate. The second is a hold mandate. Lastly, we have what we call a third party mandate with which the investor may wish to send their dividend or interest to someone other than the parties on their account or institution of their choice. Your girl's been coming along well. <laughs> Thanks, man. You know, it's a long time I've been working at it. I can see that. I saw you mail by the gate, uh, so I'll pick it up you. for you. But tell me something, why are you still receiving dividend checks by mail? What do you mean about that? You need to give JCST a mandate. You know, me hear about the mandate then. I'm going over there right now. A mandate means giving instructions to the Jamaica Central Securities Depository Limited, JCST, relating to the handling of your dividend or interest payment. There are three types of mandates. The first is a bank mandate. The second is a hold mandate. Lastly, we have what we call a third party mandate with which the investor may wish to send their dividend or interest to someone other than the parties on their account or institution of their choice.
What do these people <coughs> know that you don't know? They understand how listing on the Jamaica Stock Exchange can improve the profitability of their company. They know the potential for increasing the company's capital, the governance requirements, the tax responsibilities, the ownership implications, and the procedures for listing. They have the knowledge to make an informed decision on whether or not to go public. Knowledge is power. If you don't know, you can't act. Begin a conversation with the Jamaica Stock Exchange to gain the information you need to make a decision. I'm Stafford Burroughs, CEO of Dolphin Cove Limited, and we're listed on the junior markets of the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Call today to begin your conversation. Call 876-967-3271. The Jamaica Stock Exchange. Transformations through conversations, making your life after business and work possible. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Andre Gooden, and it is my distinct honor and pleasure to be your moderator this morning for this very, very important session, likely to be very informative, instructive, and exciting, may I say. Um, as we normally do at functions of the Jamaica Stock Exchange, we always start with prayer. So before we go any further, I would ask Mr. Samuel Parks, principal of the Jamaica Stock Exchange eCampus, to lead us in prayer. Principal Parks, are you there? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy that you have bestowed upon us. And Father, it is not anything that we have done that you have allowed us to experience this another moment in time, but it is solely because of your love, your grace, and your mercy. Father, as we come before you today, right now, the beginning of this another webinar that we seek to inform and to educate person as to how they can go about raising and deploying equity capital. Father, I pray, oh God, that you will take full control of this session and you, you will bless each and every participant, each and every presenter, and collectively that at the end of this webinar, we can indeed attain the objectives that have been established. So Father, have thy own way, oh God, and just take full control and continue to keep and to protect and to guide and to care. These and every other mercies we ask in your precious and humble name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Principal. We are grateful for the, for the blessing this morning. Okay. Um, as I said, this is a very, um, will be a very good session. We thank you for taking the time to join us today. Um, those of you have, who have already been through the capital raising process and those contemplating same, uh, you will find this, hope you find this presentation, this seminar very uh, useful. Um, our first, uh, first before we um, commence the, our managing director, 
Mrs. Marlene's good choice will do welcome and of course her opening comments. Um, Mrs. Street Farts, of course, needs no introduction, but briefly, I will just uh, remind the audience, <laughs> remind the audience that Mrs. Street Forest is the managing director of the JSE group of companies. And her mandate is to continue the process of developing the group, um, particularly the exchange, and in an atmosphere of transparency and fairness while utilizing the appropriate technology in providing the greatest possible efficiencies in the market. Those of you who are on this call, most of you would have had interaction with Mrs. Forrest. I know that she always carries a positive message. And um, today I hope, will, I, I'm sure will be no exception. In 2016, Mrs. Forrest was conferred with the order of distinction, the rank of commander in recognition of her outstanding leadership and the growth in the Jamaica Stock Exchange. And in that year also received the Afro Global Excellence Award for global impact from Canada for exhibiting great leadership, vision and integrity and commitment to excellence. She's an Observer Business Leader nominee in 2017 and was celebrated by the Institute of Gender and Development Studies of the University of West Indies as a woman pioneer. In 2018, she received from the Rotary Club of Kingston East and Port Royal Vocational Services Award, and more recently from that same club, the Paul Harris Fellowship, which is the highest honor a Rotary Club can bestow on anyone. Um, as a Rotarian myself, it's a very proud moment for me as well. And um, she is also a recipient of a, port of a Vocational Services Award and was re recently recognized by the Alex Ihama School of Greatness as the business leader of the decade. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I introduce Managing Director of the Jamaica Stock Exchange, which is Marlene Street Forrest, to bring her remarks. Mrs. Forrest, good morning. Good morning, Andre, our group business development manager. I thought my mic was on, Andre, when I said no introduction, <laughs> but thank you. Um, let me also recognize, I think he might not be on as yet, Honorable Michael Leachin, Chairman Portland Holdings, Mr. Stephen Gooden, CEO NCB Capital Markets Limited, Ms. Tracy and Spencer, COO NCB and it's Spence, COO NCB Capital Markets Limited and other members of the NCB team, Dr. William Lawrence, strategy consultant and former director of Mona School of Business and Management, Mr. Beresford Gray, co-founder, president and CEO, Cygnus Capital, Mr. Samuel Sparks, principal JCE campus, other members of the NCB team or the members of the JC team, members of the media, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, all those persons from the various companies that are listed on the exchange and those who intend to list on the exchange. Good morning. It is really a pleasure to be speaking to you at this webinar. You know, the, the topic, as we said, is raising and deploying equity capital for restructuring, restoring and renewing. And we have been talking about this for some time, Dr. Lawrence. And uh, we, we, we said we must speak about this. It's a part of our conference topic. And we said we must speak about this soon because it is such an important part of what companies need to look at. And, you know, especially as a time of as now, where we are in a pandemic before, but also right now. I want to pause and thank NCB Capital Markets Limited for sponsoring this event. Without them, it would be probably difficult, but NCB has always joined us in uh, sponsoring events that really go to the heart of the growth of our market. And we want to thank you. We welcome all that are present and uh, you know, the exchange believes that 
at this point, we, while it is that many of our listed companies that are on and are listening have already raised equity capital. So, you know, you know what it is, you know the advantages of raising equity capital. When one of the things that possibly many companies don't do is again to focus um, on what are the other advantages there are to raising that capital. And my remarks therefore today will be short, but it will be centered around capital, the key to long-term growth and innovation. And uh, what we can see today and many companies would have experienced is that immediately capital was raised your business, and I want to go from it from a practical standpoint, what I have seen having sat at the exchange for a few years now, that most of the companies having that injection of equity capital have seen such growth and development. And the reason is that the equity capital is patient capital, and it allows you to do so much more than you would normally do. Um, it allows you to look at research and development, find a way to um, look at innovative um, products and services, find a way to also get the key, and I want to underscore the key resources many times that a company would not, and that is in terms of manpower or assets, et cetera, that a company would not normally have gotten initially. Obviously, with a capital structure, you have debt and you have equity. And we are not saying there's no place for debt. But the fact is that the equity capital is patient. So it allows for that innovation. It allows for development. And especially at this time, we, we see that it is critical when you have a pandemic. The fact also is that we have seen that with companies that have come to market, because of the call on shareholders to say, what is next? What's next? How can I, how can you increase that value for me? That equity capital allows for and pushes, you know, because of the shareholder behind it, pushes the company to hunt for new venture to look at how can I be more competitive? How can I do more so that my shareholders understand and appreciate that we are working for them? So these are some of the things that, you know, um, looking at the, what equity capital does for the long-term growth of the company, you can see that these are all very, positive. I know that many persons say, look, but we want to contain that the shareholder part to the 20% minimum that the JSE requires. Because yes, we have those shareholders, but we don't want too much on, of them breathing down our backs, or we don't want to reach to um, a level um, that is uh, of concentration nearer to the 50%. And, but there is a lot of room between 20 and 50. So 20% is the minimum, not the maximum. And again, there is the concern that uh, probably after some considering it at some point, I don't need so much equity capital when you look on the balance in terms of your, your mix between debt and equity. I want to remind um, listed companies that you also though have the provision within the Companies Act as to the buyback of shares. So that is also a tool that one can use if at some point you feel that, um, and there is real reason for it, that you could exercise that rule in terms of um, the Companies Act and actually the JSE's rule in terms of buyback. But always remember that um, 
when you look on it, leveraging, while a bank will lend the loan and there's a place for it, but the the one of the considerations that always take place is how much leverage that company is. And so one wants to, and I know Dr. Lawrence will go into all of that, one wants to look on that in terms of how, how you calibrate your balance sheet. And so the equity capital is really important, an important consideration. Um, Dr. Lawrence will give you all the reasons today as to um, how to look at and uh, to calibrate that balance sheet, as I said before. Um, he's going to be aiming at examining capital structures of, of some of our listed companies. And I'm interested to listen to all of that. Um, one of the things, though, that uh, I want to leave with you is the fact that the equity capital allows for agility. The seminar today will provide insight on how agile one can be in terms of um, that mix between equity and, and debt. And I encourage you to take advantage of all the discussions that will be taking place. We have very qualified persons whether it is through experience or through research. And therefore, it is important to take advantage, ask the questions that are necessary. And just in closing, I just want to remind um, all of our participants that there is a, a difference between the ordinary and the extraordinary in terms of how business really um, is driven. And that to me, and I know we people say, because I'm at the stock exchange, but no, I've seen it. And that to me, the ex what makes it extraordinary is uh, the equity capital that is employed. Again, thank you and just stay tuned. Enjoy the seminar today. Um, have a good day. Thank you very much, Mrs. Forrest. As usual, um, very positive presentation and gives us a lot to consider and a lot to look forward to. Um, I was so anxious to get the program started that I forgot to mention to the audience that we will be having a coincidental and anxious session immediately after Dr. Lawrence's presentation. So you can make note of your questions and you will have an opportunity to ask them directly. So here we are, you're looking to raise capital. Having raised the capital, how do you deploy it for most efficient use? Or um, how do you, in this time of where we have to be considering restructuring our balance sheets, restoring our profitability and renewing our, um, our commitments to our lines of business, Equity capital certainly is key. And none other than Dr. William Lawrence, uh, the strategy consultant who has founded and directed the professional service unit at the Mona School of Business and Management on the Mona campus, uh, will be guiding us through this very important aspect. Prior to his employment, Dr. Lawrence worked 26 years in industry and as an effective business executive and industrial engineer. Dr. Lawrence has helped many prominent Caribbean organizations to develop, implement successful strategic plans. And his research has guided government of Jamaica policy on MSME business sustainability. He is chair of the academic review committee of the Jamaica Stock Exchange eCampus and board chair chairman of the Jamaica Business Development Corporation. He has written over 60 scholarly papers on technical reports in the field of strategic management. And his recent publications appear in conference proceedings of prestigious, the prestigious US Academy of Management and also the International Journal of Productivity and Performance Management. 
is model for business turnaround is the cover story of the May 2011 edition of Industrial Engineer magazine. He served as an adjunct professor at four reputable international universities and has represented, presented, sorry, research papers at conferences in North, Central America, Asia Pacific, Western Europe, and of course, across the Caribbean. His popular book titled The Business Renewal and Performance in Jamaica is one of the best sellers from the University of the West Indies Press. And I'm sure he'll be quoting some of some from that presentation um, this morning. It is my pleasure to introduce to you, Dr. William Lawrence. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Moderator Andre, and a pleasant good morning to all participants in this webinar. Let me recognize Mrs. Marlene Street Forrest, Managing Director of the Stock Exchange, and also the Honorable Michael Lee Chen, and thank him for his years of sterling contributions to the country. The entire team at the Jamaica Stock Exchange, hardworking as usual. The sponsors, NCB Capital Markets, I'm certainly no stranger to the NCB team, and all others present, and I'll observe all protocols. Thank you. Let me just share my screen as we get to it. Uh, hopefully. Yes, we're seeing it, sir. Okay. All right. So, you know, Marlene has, in fact, put the entire thing in marvelous perspective. My presentation this morning, brief as it is, looks at two things. One, the impact of equity capital on company profitability. And two, how to utilize capital for business restructuring and renewal. Now, I'm not saying by any means that debt capital is not important. But as you will see, my data shows that equity capital is severely underutilized in Jamaica. Why is this information important? Public equity has been underutilized right across the board. Although there are over 12,000 large and mid-sized companies filing general consumption tax returns annually in Jamaica, less than 1%, less than 1% of these companies are listed on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Moreover, a substantial majority of the companies that are listed on the Jamaica Stock Exchange do not seek equity capital after their initial public offer. Ironically, while financing is often stated as a major problem for businesses in Jamaica, very few companies make preparation to access this affordable and patient capital, even though, as Mrs. Street Forrester said, the steps for listing are prominent on the Stock Exchange's website. My research shows that this neglect not only constrains company profitability, but also retards Jamaica's recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Because as you know, the private sector is the engine for driving us toward economic growth. You may be aware that the Jamaica Stock Exchange Index fell precipitously in the first quarter of last year. In fact, the index fell by 34% from roughly 510,000 points at the start of 2020 to just about 340,000 points in March due to country lockdown. The index warned of impending recession as early as January, and the index 
Subsequently, in July, signaled the start of economic recovery. Yes, the country has started economic recovery, despite the fact that we're still in negative territory. So even though the Jamaica Stock Exchange is relatively small by global standards, the main JCE index can indicate forthcoming economic recession and signal the start of economic recovery. I looked at the performance of 21 financial firms and 41 non-financial firms relative to GDP growth for each quarter of last year, 2020. And on screen, the blue bars represent financial firms, the yellow bars, non-financial. And we're talking about the percentage of firms that reported losses for each of the four quarters of last year. This sample was selected to coincide with the quarterly reports from the Planning Institute of Jamaica. As you see from the bars, financial firms, the blue bars, were most affected at the start in Q1, with 43% of the companies reporting losses due to global decline in asset prices. Non-financial firms suffered from local and international lockdowns, and 32% of the sample companies reported losses in the second quarter. Please note that the decline in GDP growth, as evidenced by the red line below the bars, from Q1 to Q2, uh, points to the economic contraction that occurred over the first half of last year. And you will also note that the red line below the bars started to rise again from the third quarter into the fourth quarter as company losses were abated. Also, as you will see, financial firms recovered much faster than non-financial companies over the period Q3, Q4. As company losses diminished in the last half of last year, so too the GDP contraction. Therefore, this is evidence that there is positive correlation between company profitability and economic recovery during the first year of the pandemic, 2020. I want to also say that the top performing companies last year had sufficient equity capital at the start of the pandemic to do two things, to cushion the impact of the recession and to fuel strategy execution for recovery. Several companies were in this bracket, but I want to highlight one in particular. The Jamaica Money Market Brokers Group, JMMB, if one of those is one of those companies, and this company, as you may know, frequently utilizes fresh equity capital from the stock exchange to drive profit and expansion. Let's take a closer look at JMMB over the years. JMMB utilizes public equity for both organic and inorganic growth. The company had its IPO back in 2002, and years later, in 2019, the additional public offer. But in between, the company had several issues of preference shares, a total of eight between 2003 and 2020. You will note from the red line, which is profit, that there are a couple of peaks. The first peak in the red line, the profit line, occurring between 2003 and say 2006. During this period, JMMB used equity to acquire 50% of intercommercial bank in Trinidad and also penetrate the market of the Dominican Republic. The sharp peak that you see in 2013 
was when JMMB acquired the Capital and Credit Merchant Bank Group right here in Jamaica, again driven by preference shares issued around about that time. And the very sharp rise in the red line that you see going up 2019, 2020, represents JMMB's move to acquire 22.5% of Align Vest, the holding company of Sajikor Financial Corporation. When you look at the data from 1995 to 2019, the statistics show that JMMB has had a significant 88% correlation between the shareholders' equity that it has at the start of each year and the profit that it obtains at the end of the year. And of course, for those who are interested, there is a significant regression model shown below. So this very high correlation between equity at the start of the period and profit at the end of the period is not unique to GMMB, but I thought that I like this special case given the prolific way that this company has been utilizing, or should I say, exploiting the patient capital from the stock exchange. Despite strong evidence that equity capital is a driver of company profitability, only a few of the listed companies have obtained more of this capital after IPO. For the period 2010 to 2020, the cluster of bars on the left of your screen shows that only 44% of financial firms listed issued preference shares, and even fewer had APOs or preference share issues. The cluster of bars on the right of the chart shows that this neglect is more chronic for non-financial firms on the JSC. Only 18% over the 10 year period issued preference shares and APO and rice issues were far less as well. My statistics shows that non-financial companies have even a greater need for equity capital than financial firms. And yet the listed non-financial firms have been using the exchange for additional equity to a less extent. Consider this, a bank that has an equity ratio of 15% is considered by the regulators to be adequately capitalized. But a manufacturing company with twice that equity ratio at 30% run the risk of encountering cash flow problems and financial distress. So it's clear that the listed financial companies need to take a hard look at utilizing more of the stock exchanges avenues for additional capital. Now, as I'm sure you know, acquiring the equity is just one part of the equation. You've got to deploy equity properly for you to get the value out. And as Marlene has said, whereas a large majority of companies listed have made good use of this equity, there are a few that needed to have paid closer attention to deployment. For example, on the service side, and by the way, all the data in my presentation is available to the public from internet sources. General Accident Insurance became listed on the Juno market in 2011. And what you see on screen is the red line representing equity, and below it, the blue line represented profit, representing profit. And you can see the green dotted line is the point of IPO. You can see that having acquired the equity, the red line goes up as expected. But so too did the profit line, as General Accident had the strategy and business model to make good use of the equity it acquired. In contrast, key insurance company 
became listed in 2014 and uh, 2016 rather. And you can see the red line again, where the company had the equity rise in the red line. But shortly after the red line was eroded, equity was eroded as the company incurred losses. Again, the business model not sufficiently strong to make use of the equity. You will also know that Grace Kennedy acquired key insurance last year and the last two quarters of this company's report last year shows substantial turnaround as adjustments have been made to the business model. On the good side, you'll be very familiar with Jamaica Broilers, a stalwart company that has continued to use equity to drive growth. So the red line has an upward trajectory and so too the blue line profit in the meat industry. However, also in the meat industry, take a look at Sweet River Abattoir. It came listed in 2014, got the equity, but because of a weak business model, incurred severe losses, equity was eroded, and unfortunately, the company was delisted. The fact is that equity acquisition, raising equity, and equity deployment are two sides of the same coin. And in this era of the pandemic, what becomes front and center when we're talking about deploying capital is business restructuring and renewal. I developed a model for business renewal, which is published in my peer reviewed book available from Amazon and Kingston Bookshop. This business renewal performance model has been stress tested and ratified by both academia and international public bodies. And after years, I have still found no instance of business turnaround that deviates from the prescriptions in my model. This business renewal performance model prescribes five steps, A, B, C, D, and E, for business recovery from losses and financial distress. And the feedback I've been having from all over the world confirms that the model is also being used to avoid losses in the first place. Now, how does the model work? I've just simply summarized one of the business cases contained in my book, that of Denos and Gettys Red Stripe, which as you know, is a leading manufacturer and distributor in Jamaica. Red Stripe incurred severe losses in the 1990s, consequent to the liberalization of trade and exchange controls that plunged the country into deep recession. It happened at a time when Red Stripe was making the transition from being a family-run company headed by Paul Geddes, who did a marvelous job, to becoming a subsidiary of a multinational company. First, a subsidiary of Guinness International, and then Guinness was subsequently acquired by a large brood and alcoholic beverage multinational, Diageo. The company implemented intuitively the prescriptions in my model and was able to achieve turnaround. Please note on screen the close relationship or relation between the dotted line, which is equity ratio, and the black line, which is return on assets. Again, equity being closely correlated with profit. In fact, over the 20 year period, 1982 to 2002, Red Stripe had a 71% correlation between profit and equity. Now, those who are in my age bracket will remember that the government grant a concession to Red Stripe, which took effect after 2002 in terms of a waiver of income taxes. But that occurred after Red Stripe had achieved turnaround and had been growing exponentially. So the chart you see on screen 
precedes government concession to the company. And I thought I'd make that point because it was quite controversial at the time. So intuitively, in assessing viability, Red Stripe was in a growth industry beverage and had access to one of the most powerful beverage networks worldwide, Diageo, as its parent. The company boosts liquidity by issuing a right, having a rights issue on the stock exchange, which it used to liquidate debt. The company had been steeped in both US dollar debt and Jamaican dollar debt. And for those of us who can remember, there were sharp rises in interest rates and the exchange rate during the early part of the 1990s. In choosing strategy, the company refocused on brute products, which is a core strength of the parent company. In other words, Red Stripe divested non-core businesses, such as its ownership of Jamaica lithographic printers, and also its investment in West Indies glass. And it also divested its soft drink business, DNG soft drink, and came out of the alcoholic beverage business to refocus only on brood products with Red Stripe being the flagship brand and the introduction of innovations such as Malta, the non-alcoholic brood product. In deploying its business model locally and globally, the brand was positioned as a boutique premium brand. In other words, the focus was on value, not volume, backed by the technical and marketing expertise of the Diageo network. And the company enhanced its efficiency at the time by implementing enterprise resource planning technology to synchronize all departments and all functions. And it adopted several total quality management projects, including benchmarking international breweries, using more statistical process control and implementing a suite of lean projects to minimize waste. So this is a clear example of the model at work. And the fact is that in this era of the fourth industrial revolution, the World Economic Forum in their annual reports have repeatedly reminded Jamaica that the private sector needs to do much more in adopting technology and doing more innovation. And so it is no wonder that digital transformation is on the lips of just about every company in the country and the region. And digital transformation, as you know, refers to the adoption of binary electronic technologies to shape or replace business models for more value and productivity from innovation and customer service. And worldwide, companies in all industries are aggressively pursuing digital transformation to get more value out. And especially now with the pandemic, recovery is going to be going to require a lot more digital transformation to deploy capital effectively for restructuring and renewal. Last year, McKinsey did a global survey of digital adoption across different industries worldwide. And I've just put a few on screen that might be more relevant for us in the Caribbean and certainly Jamaica. As at August last year, the banking and financial sector were leading the way in terms of efforts to adopt digital technologies. Media and entertainment followed. Even the grocery operators in their mature sector have been trying to push forward. Healthcare is also there. We note at the bottom of the bars that insurance and travel are still at an early stage. But the McKinsey report suggests that more resources are being put in these areas. So we should not be surprised to see radical uptick in the percent of companies adopting 
digital technologies to transform their business models. But how do you implement it? Well, if you take a look at the chart on the right, you see two sets of boxes, a set of boxes to the left, which represents the typical digital technologies, and a set of boxes to the right, which summarizes a typical value chain. When you look to the right, the top two boxes, marketing and distribution and goods and services, are on the demand side of the value chain, while procurement and supply and processes are on the supply side of the chain. When McKinsey did this global survey back in 2018, most of the activity for digital transformation were concentrated on the demand side. But they've recently reported that the supply side has seen substantial shift. So these percentages, which total 100%, should see far more balance uh, when you compare the supply side of the value chain with the um, demand side of the chain. But I'm obliged to re remind all participants present that your business model is not only about your value chain, it is also about your value proposition. And in fact, your value chain should always be subordinated and aligned to your value proposition, which is your compelling message to your customers for them to do business with you. I am suggesting quite strongly, if you haven't done so yet, that for each business unit that you have, you download a free business model canvas template from Google and map the value chain and value proposition that you have and check for alignment even before you reach for technology. Please use a business model canvas template free of cost to ensure that each business unit that you have has value chain, supply and demand aligned to the value proposition. Many of you would know that there are nine elements in the typical business model canvas. And in my consulting practice, I find it very useful to ensure alignment. Now, when you look to the boxes on the left with the technologies, McKinsey with his surveys continue to insist that many companies worldwide are investing too much money and in the wrong places. You note all those arrows going all over the place. Companies are investing in many cases too much money and in the wrong places. I am suggesting that to minimize the chance of this happening to you in your organization, before you spend the money on technologies for digital transformation, you use a factor rating table template, also freely available from Google, a factor rating table to look at how each of the technology that you're con contemplating measures up against a set of weighted criteria. And your list of criteria should include at least potential revenue, cost, and risk, at least these three. So you use a factor rating table, have several columns, have your criteria, weight the criteria with the sum of the criteria, totaling one or 100%, and then you assess each of the technology that you're considering against each criteria, multiply by, by the weight to get a weighted score, and when you sum the weighted scores up, it tells you two things. One, what your technology mix should be. And two, what sequence you should use to invest in digital technologies. So again, 
the business model canvas to ensure that your value chain is properly aligned to your value proposition before you even consider technology. And two, a factor rating table to ensure that you are investing the right amount of money in the right places and not wasting effort in the process. In conclusion, and I look forward to your questions and comments. We know that Jamaica is no stranger to economic recession, although this is the worst. Make no joke about that. We've seen the oil crisis of the 1970s, economic liberalization in the 1990s, the global financial meltdown, the mortgage crisis around about 2007, 2008, and now, heaven forbid, this awful global pandemic. What you see on chart, the blue line represents GDP growth, which signals recession. Sorry, the, the, um, the uh, red line signaling recession. Every time the red line dips, it heads towards recession. And you will note that every time it dips in a major way, the blue line goes up, which is the percent of companies on the stock exchange that report losses. Recession induces company losses on the stock exchange. But all is not lost because as I've shown, we can take steps to mitigate the situation. The first step is to leverage or exploit equity capital from the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Having less than 1% of our companies filing GCT returns on the exchange cannot be acceptable. We need to have more companies accessing this affordable and patient capital. And secondly, having access to capital, please ensure that steps are taken to deploy capital properly. And if you're going after digital transformation, pay attention to your business model, value chain and value proposition first, then look at your technology mix relative to the benefits that you can get. What I'm saying is there are a few critical strategic actions that I believe should be done with urgent dispatch. The first, I'm suggesting that the Jamaica Stock Exchange should continue to negotiate to get more partners to increase stock market literacy and company and holding for initial public offers. Some of you may know that a few years ago, the Stock Exchange partnered with the Inter-American Development Bank to fast track listings on the stock exchange. And within a few short years, the number of listings rose from less than 10 companies on the junior market to more than 30. I'm suggesting that more partners need to come on board. So Mr. Street Forest aggressively pursued the private sector organization of Jamaica, for example, to step up to the plate to get more of these companies on board. Work aggressively with the Ministry of Industry, Investment and Commerce. It is not lost on me that our Minister of Finance emphasized repeatedly the role of the private sector in having us recover from this awful pandemic. And the stock exchange must be at the heart of that. More companies must come on board to make money and to have, by extension, the country recover as fast as it can from the pandemic. Just yesterday, it was reported that the Caribbean Development Bank had projected that the region, Caribbean region, would possibly realize 3.8% GDP growth, real growth, this year in 2021, 3.8%. And despite the fact that this is modest, 
and would not see us at full recovery. The World Bank appears to have disagreed, feeling that this, even this, is too optimistic, saying that unless the private sector does much more, its numbers coming shortly might not even reach the stage of an average of 3.8% growth for the Caribbean. So this first recommendation, in my view, could not be more urgent. Secondly, you have seen my figures, and I'm open to discuss the statistics with you. I think that far more companies that are already listed should stop leaving money on the table. The situation is very chronic for non-financial firms in particular. Put your arrangements in place to become listed to benefit from the APO. You know, I've cited money market brokers, but I can also cite many others. For example, you've seen what NCB has done, and I'm close to that organization in my consulting as well. Stop leaving money on the table. Make more money by accessing more equity. The options are there to drive your growth and by extension to lead this country more quickly out of the pandemic. And finally, consider my business renewal and performance model to deploy capital. There's no point spinning wheels without stress testing your business models before. Please stress test your business models. You know, and as I speak about digital transformation, I want to, to say this. Many of the consultancies that I do in helping companies develop strategic plans invariably put data analytics among the list of strategic initiatives, data analytics, and they are resolved to acquiring the technologies to help with that process. I am strongly suggesting that before you spend any money on technology for data analytics, look at the free and open source options. The free and open source guys are doing some amazing work in providing technologies for data analytics that you will find useful. At the risk of providing an advertisement, I have been using a free and open source package called Weka, W-E-K-A, which is a big data analytics package, free and open source, that was developed by Waikato University out of New Zealand. It's freely available. Just go Google and type in Weka, W-E-K-A, and you can download this on your computer or tablet or whatever you're using. The beauty about this package is that you don't have to be a computer programmer to use it. It's all there. In other words, you don't have to write codes in Python or R. It's that user-friendly. And it has a lot of built-in machine learning algorithms that most executive senior managers will find user-friendly. And the graphics for visualization and dashboards are quite good. Please, before you go spending money on technology for data analytics, check out the free and open source software that are available. And you can start by looking at Weka as an example. With that, uh, thank you for listening to my ramble. Let me pass it back to the moderator and please remain safe. The spike is still upon us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Lawrence. I wouldn't call it rambling at all, sir. I think the a very wholesome, very informative presentation. We can take questions now, but um, I, I would want to ask one, sir, um, just to kick off. Uh, you mentioned, okay, I'm a, I'm a company, let's say, contemplating raising capital. I have raised capital now. And I want to be sure that it is deployed correctly. You're talking about companies that have made 
tactical or operational errors in deploying capital that they have raised. And one of the solutions you suggested is that they re-examine their business model. What weaknesses would have in your mind? I mean, I don't know how deep you went into the analysis of, let's say non-financial companies, but what would have caused, what errors were made then after raising capital? What you would you see as the common errors? You mentioned the business model, but is there a particular aspect of the business model that would have led to less than optimal returns on investment. Um, what do you see as the common problem? Just to guide some of our um, potential listees online or those who have already listed, what do you see as the common tactical, operational, strategic errors in the business model that cause the lack of return on investment? Return on capital, I should say. What's for that very important question? What I'm seeing across CARICOM in particular in some cases is a disconnect between the strategy and value proposition that is declared or implicit in the company's behavior and the value chain that they actually have. In many cases, the companies declare an aspiration. We would like to achieve X, Y, and Z. But when you look at the business model, and the resources that are being committed and the way they are committed, there is a disconnect. So what I suggest, I am aware that many companies use the balanced scorecard system for strategic planning, and it is quite robust. I am suggesting to mitigate the problem that you have outlined, Andre, that on a single table, once you've prepared your strategic plan, you come up with a simple four column table to look at the efficacy of your plan and whether or not you are committing enough resources. Just four columns. The first column should say what your strategic goals are. What are your financial goals? What are your goals for the customer and the market? What are your goals for your operations? And what are your goals for innovation and growth going forward? The second column from the plan should say what are the gaps, the strategic gaps, between the goals or aspirations that you've stated and the way you are performing right now. So simply, what are the gaps? And you list those along the lines of financial gaps, customer and market gaps, operational gaps, your innovation and growth gaps. The third column, which is the penultimate column, should say, what are the areas of focus to close these gaps? What areas of focus? And these are commonly called strategic objectives. What I've seen across the Caribbean is that many companies do a SWOT analysis with a long list of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, but forget that the primary objective of the SWOT analysis is to close the gaps identified. So if you're not clear on what your strategic gaps are, the second column, you might end up focusing with your objectives on areas that might miss the mark. And the fourth and final column in the table, your strategic initiatives, which are your programs and projects, should be specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound, smart. I have found that many companies have very, very ambitious programs. But when they reach for the talent to execute, they find that they have not invested enough in talent development. And I know I'm being a bit long-winded, but talent development, Andre, is crucial 
do not skimp on the budget, especially now on talent development. Sometimes the expertise and acumen you're looking for is right within the company, but at lower levels and obscure in the organization. Scour your talent pool, see where the nuggets are and invest in talent. Do it internally before you go outside. Andre? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Very comprehensive. I will now open the floor if there's any questions from any of our participants uh, for Dr. Lawrence. This is your opportunity. If you so wish, you may type them in as well. Um, but I'm giving the opportunity to open your mic and um, uh, pose your own question. We have a question. Going once, it's as clear as day, Dr. Lawrence. Um, I know that your questions. They can always put them in the chat. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, certainly, you can put them in the chat and we can, uh, with your email address, and we can answer them off the, um, off the record if you so wish. Um, last opportunity here for any, other, any, any additional questions, any questions? Andre, I note that persons are asking if the presentation will be available. This of course is for the stock exchange to decide. So I don't know if you wish to take that or defer it for now. Sure, sir. If you're willing to share the information, we will be am, happy to share the information, sir. I, I am. You will have the presentation immediately following uh, the webinar. I'm going to continue. Go, go ahead, sir. For a startup company to be listed on the main market, because there are, the, the startup capital would be about a billion dollars, which is twice the junior market limit. So is it possible for a startup to go on the main market? Thank you for that question. And the short answer is yes. If you look at the history of the exchange, the main market existed before the junior market. Right. As far as 1992, yeah. brand new company, called Daring, Bunting, and Holding. Okay. Straight yeah. onto the main right. market and has done very well to the point where the Scotia Group bought the okay. company years later. Okay. Thanks very much for that one. Okay. Thank you. Uh, um, okay, thank you very much. I see uh, so Thomas asked a question, what help is available for companies now considering the methodology of strategic renewal that has been outlined? How is it possible to gain additional training and guidance? My understanding is that the Jamaica Stock Exchange eCampus is looking to introduce in short order an executive level course on business renewal that will use practical templates and real data from real companies to participants on yeah. how to uh, implement and deploy capital effectively. But I believe we have the principle of the e-campus online. So let me not speak out of turn. Maybe Mr. Parks might wish to comment. Or Mr. Street Forest as well. Go ahead, Mr. Fox. Well, um, thank you, Dr. Williams. So we are in the process of um, fine tuning in short order, um, further enhanced training, um, which would enable um, one to garner the relevant resources um, to be more effective in that sphere. And in very short order, we'll be um, circulating it um, so that prospective participants can engage. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Principal. That is, that is capacity development is a big part of what will be happening at the um, Jamaica Stock Exchange campus. So certainly, as, as we go forward, as the, uh, we see the demand growing and we are trying to address that demand right away. Um, there's a question, Doctor, about the, to just repeat the, the fourth column. Apparently, somebody was taking some notes and you went rather quickly through and they asked what, <laughs> what the fourth column is. The fourth column is what many companies already do. It's the strategic initiatives to execute the plan, which typically are the programs and projects that are aligned to the objectives. And I'm saying that each strategic initiative, each program or project should be smart, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and time bound. Thank you, thank you very much for that, sir. Any other questions uh, before we uh, press ahead? We're about, about, about 10, 15 minutes behind schedule. So I'll take one more question if there's any. I'm Andre Neville Ellis here. There, there are about two other questions in the chat. Can you just um, address them? Okay. Um, there is the, okay. Um, question about R&D. Um, innovation comes from R&D. And as it stands, the only company with R&D in its financial statements is Wigton Wind Farm. What can Dr. Lawrence um, do to encourage Jamaican companies to have R&D as part of its costs <laughs> as, as research and development? Um, All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. You know, this has been a vexing concern of mine for a few years because it's not just the private companies who are on the investing in R&D. If you look at the capital expenditure of the government in this budget every year, long before the pandemic, R&D has been just not there at all. Remember that the primary purpose of R&D is to generate new knowledge. R&D by itself is not innovation. It creates the means by which innovation can occur. Innovation is when you take this new knowledge and make money from it. It's very important that the government, when it can, come on board and invest more in this area. Again, the World Economic Forum Global Competitiveness Survey reports have pointed out that Jamaica ranks very low among the list of countries in its R&D spend. And so I think the government can lead by example, but I'm also encouraging companies to reserve a part of their budget for R&D. And I want to close by saying R&D can start with some simple projects. R&D doesn't have to begin with a very big budget. Take a look at your value proposition. Take a look at your value chain. Identify the main areas of weakness and consider what affordable projects you can start with. Okay, thank you. There's one other which I may need a clarification on, but I'll read it. Um, in the conclusion, sir, you stated on, that companies listed on a JSC use IPOs, should use IPOs to increase their capital. However, from a valuation perspective, this sometimes dilutes multiple factors. How can this gap be bridged. I'm not sure what multiple factors I is referring to here. Um, um, yes, that's an excellent question. Acquiring capital for its own sake will not get the job done. You've got to acquire the capital for a purpose. And this is why the deployment of capital is so important. Please note the meticulous way in which investment bankers such as NCP, Capital Markets, and others, peruse prospectus to make sure that the deployment side is there. 
if you don't have a robust strategy and plan, action plan, to deploy the capital, as I've shown in the cases I presented, you will get the capital and then you will pay the price in that you will not maximize value and that eventually leads to capital erosion. So your capital should be there to support and resource your strategic plan. Okay, thank you very much. And there must be contingencies in the plan as well, sir. Um, I'm sure that, I think you mentioned that as well. For example, if I decide that I'm raising 600 million primarily for technology, technology investment, and I realized down the line that uh, the return on that investment is not happening, I need to certainly pivot before I deploy all of the 600 million down that road. So That's certainly right. contingencies have to be in place as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Um, excellent, excellent presentation, very informative. And for all the listed companies online or those contemplating listing, um, we hope that you found the presentation useful in preparing your business plans um, and your strategic plans for implementation in 2021. All right. Um, we have to move on in the interest of time. And uh, thank you very much again, Dr. Lawrence. And I, I hope that you can hang You're around. Welcome. I hope that you can hang around and, um, and, and uh, share in some of the other presentations here. Uh, okay. Our next presenter is Mr. Beresford Gray. Um, Ber Beresford Gray will speak on the topic of how and why we raise additional capital um, from a, that's a, a sort of a testimonial. Barry says, widely considered as one of the region's top investment bankers, as one of the founders of Cygnus Capital, he's living out his passion to create lead, leading non-traditional financial institutions firm that uses creative approaches to unlock capital for clients. His career was launched in the European debt and capital markets where he worked as an associate director in investment banking with particular focus on securitization and structured finance. After returning to the Caribbean, he held key positions at leading regional banks where he used the out-of-box thinking to generate game-changing results. This includes setting up and driving Scotia Investments Capital Market Unit to become a leader in the local market within three years and contributing significantly to the turnaround in CIBC, First Caribbean's Corporate and Commercial Banking Center between 2013 and 2016. Beres has the knowledge and talent and leadership skills to move Cygnus Capital forward. He was a MBA in Entrepreneurial Finance from the Blerick Leuven Management School in Belgium and a Master's in Economics from the University of the West Indies. He has also completed a one-year executive leadership program from the very heralded Wharton School of Business in Pennsylvania. Uh, now, I invite you, Mr. Gray, to join us to make your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, over to Beres. Um, thanks very much, Andre, and good morning to everyone. And uh, I must start by saying um, thanks to the JSC for inviting me to share my thoughts on this um, very important topic of um, raising capital and how do you actually do that, especially equity capital within the context of the current environment. And I uh, also want to commend the JSC for continually pushing initiatives to move our capital markets forward, deepen the, the knowledge base across Jamaica and the region, and exciting, I would say, the diaspora about the Jamaica equity markets and capital markets in general. Um, so what I will do, I will share some thoughts primarily around um, why Cygnus Credit Investment, our private credit investment company, actually raised equity capital um, in December 2020. And I will also talk about 
some of the benefits associated with raising equity capital versus debt. And um, Marlene indicated at a very high level some of those benefits, but I, I will, you know, <laughs> re-emphasize them and say that Cygnus credit investment uh, actually enjoy some of those benefits and I'll point to those examples. Um, when, 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 when a company um, look at its strategic plans, you know, whether it's grow, growing organically or um, growing by acquisition or, um, you know, developing and launching new products. And it, it has to think about how it will fund its business activity. And you normally have the, the decision to either fund it from cash flow or go external to the capital markets or the bank market to raise equity, obviously, or debt financing. Um, in the case of Cygnus Credit Investment, um, that focus on investing in prim primarily in medium-sized firms across the Caribbean, the decision that we had to make early last year was how do we grow the business consistently over the next um, two years, over a 24 month period. And we came up with a plan to raise capital in the form of debt and equity. Um, unfortunately in March last year, we, we entered the pandemic and uh, I think Jamaica um, shut down in and around March 10th, almost one year ago, exactly one year ago to be exact. And as a consequence, um, we had to push back our desire to do an additional public offering. And, you know, we actually was paying keen attention to the capital markets last year and, and to see how things would evolve. You know, during that time, of course, we had many companies um, who we invest in and other companies in across a wide array of sectors, medium-sized firms in energy, hospitality, especially um, distribution and manufacturing, who were all making plans to um, weather the, the pandemic and, um, <laughs> and manage working capital flows. And as a consequence, in our portfolio, we had companies who needed working capital support. We all also had companies who were in the distribution business who were seeing a spike in demand for healthcare products, whether it's mask or sanitizer, you know, those type of um, products that had a spike in demand. So they needed working capital, not for liquidity purposes, but for um, um, growth purposes. So we were very, uh, I would say, keen to see the capital markets come back to some level of normalcy. And I would say I was actually quite jealous away, um, so to speak, of the US market that has a very mature alternative investment market and a very mature capital markets. Because in the middle of the, the pandemic, you know, June, July last year, September, um, if you were tracking the US market, you'd have seen um, huge IPOs, including IPOs later on in the year, such as Sinoflakes, um, Airbnb, that were raising billions of equity capital. On the alternative side, you have the big players such as Blackstone, um, Ares Capital, Carlyle Group, um, Adrian, um, that come out of Europe, were raising a record amount of dry powder. That is basically additional capital in terms of equity are launching new equity funds to basically either, in the case of say Blackstone, position themselves to take advantage of investment, equity investment opportunities. In the case of private credit companies like ourselves to position themselves to take advantage of the increase in demand that they expect from portfolio or medium-sized firm. Because naturally what you have in pandemic is that credit and debt facilities from the traditional source um, is normally pulled back and rightfully so because that capital is not as flexible as equity. So we were very uh, jealous, so to speak, of what was going on in that market. But we also understand that our ecosystem, in, both in terms of alternative investment and capital markets and the depth of it is at a different stage. 
So I was very excited and I made a uh, uh, reference to this at, uh, at earlier this year at my presentation at the Jamaica Stock Exchange Conference when um, Barita was able to launch a very successful um, IPO, uh, sorry, APO, because that tells me that the market was coming back. And as a consequence, um, Cygnus moved very quickly to organize with our brokers and arrangers to launch our APO. And I was, or let me say, the Cygnus team was very focused on executing this APO by the end of the year. And, and, and the main reason for that was we know that we need to raise this additional equity capital so that we can focus in 2021 and one, starting the year with a lot of dry powder and the dry powder in the form of equity is very flexible. It will allow us and it has allowed us to be very agile in terms of responding to client needs. It allows us to take position in investments which are more patient and that's really needed in, in an environment like this where we have to understand that um, business and normal business activities are unlikely to come back until the back end of this year, 2022. So we can't invest in a medium-sized firm that is involved in, for example, distribution or manufacturing or exporting for that matter, or transportation for that matter, and expect that they will start delivering the level of performance. With dry powder in the form of equity, we weren't on the and who is not under any pressure to either make large interest payment or thinking about if there's a credit event, for example, um, we will have to unwind those positions. So that allows us to not only be more agile and strategic in the, and customized in the way we support our investment in medium-sized firm, but also enhance our capacity to take a long-term view. And that's one of the key reasons why we raise um, equity capital rather than debt. The other reason we had to do that too is that if you saw our results as of December, because effectively we, we took on a bridge in the middle of last year, once we saw that we were going into a pandemic, we, we took a bridge facility just to ensure again that, that we have dry powder. And that bridge was um, expensive. So our net, our, our interest um, expense went up significantly. I think it went up from 100,000 the year before to about 900,000 by the end of December. So equity allow us to extinguish that um, debt. And in a pandemic, you don't want to have a lot of leverage if you don't need to. And again, that's because leverage um, imply continuous jog on your cash flow because you have to service that debt. With the equity that we raised, we were able to pay that down and re reduce our interest expense significantly. And looking forward, if there is any shocks to our balance sheet or shocks in our income uh, in terms of NI net interest income, we don't um, have that issues um, that when you have uh, a lot of leverage, you will have um, in an environment like this. Most importantly, though, by raising approximately 27 million US in new equity um, that allow us to position ourselves nicely looking forward into the future, whereby we can now leverage our, we can just, we can raise a lot more leverage once the market has normalized because our capital base will uh, would have risen by over $27 million. So if we were raising, for example, today, uh, our last year, so to speak, 20 million in, in debt at a one-to-one -one ratio, if we keep maintaining the same ratio, debt to equity one-to-one, -one, you know, we are talking about taking on more than $20 million more in debt. Um, uh, so leverage, um, which will help us to generate greater return for investors at the right time as we build out our, well, as we grow our business, um, because we have strengthened our equity base by raising additional equity capital. Um, 
um, we are now in a stronger position to achieve those objectives. Uh, on a whole, ex equity capital allow you, and in the case of Cygnus Credit Investment, not only to execute your strategic um, objectives, and in the case of Cygnus Credit Investment, our strategic objectives over the next 24 months, we are now almost six months into that process, is to grow our private credit portfolio to over 100 million. At the end of December, it was roughly um, 67 million. Um, so we expect that within the next 20, say 18 months, we will be at 100 million. And 100 million with a stronger balance sheet in terms of equity base, as well as more, even the same leverage ratio, and yet we will have more um, assets that are highly customized to generate the type of returns that we want. My final point on the benefits of raising equity capital, and as in our case, again, an APO, and I'm always very excited to see firms raising APOs, additional public offer and rights issue, um, and IPOs in the market. The, one of the big benefit is that you get the chance to reintroduce your firm to a wider set of investors. You know, we get, for example, in our case, we get to tell the story to, to investors who did not have a chance or did not participate in Cygnus Credit Investment back in 2018 when we did our IPO. Um, these investors effectively now have a chance to see how the firm has performed and has the, and had the opportunity to participate in the growth story to deepen the Caribbean private credit market. Um, so you will reintroduce your brand to the market, tell the story to new investors, prove to your show to existing investors, whether it's institutional or individual, that you have achieved what you said you were going to achieve, that build credibility for your firm, that build credibility for your brand, and most importantly, um, kind of uh, create a deeper emotional sense to your existing and new um, investors. And that's very important for long-term long -term sustainability. So those are just from, uh, you know, no time is against us, but in a snapshot, those are some of the benefits of raising equity capital um, and in the form of an APO from SCI perspective, and especially within the context of the current environment where we have a pandemic, you need to capitalize as much as possible your balance sheet with patient, flexible capital that can take a long-term perspective on investment opportunities. Um, so um, thank you very much. And I will stop now so that- um, Thank um, you, Beres. Address any question. Uh, just one quick one from me, Beres. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Dr. Lawrence's presentation uh, spoke to um, how you deploy the capital that you receive. Um, you address more now of the timing of that deployment and how do you make that decision? Having raised the capital now, you see, you decided that you're going to invest it A, B, C, and D, but the market has changed, the environment has changed. What happens in the interim um, when you hold back on deployment of that capital? What happens? How, how do you make that decision? Okay, yeah, very good question. And from C C Cygnus Credit Investment and the old Cygnus Group plays and focus on the alternative investment market. The alternative investment market um, for the, the big, the big um, platform in that space is private equity, private debt in, uh, and you know, real estate financing, hedge funds, et cetera. The reality, uh, venture capital and support, the reality is that because of our focus um, in an environment like this, we have different vehicles and um, that looking for different type of risk. risk. And, we are looking in the case of Cygnus Credit Investment at medium-sized firms that have strong businesses before the pandemic and have strong outlook for growth or continued growth um, post the pandemic. So when we are going to deploy capital, we are going to look at a business and, and the sector that's in and, and say, 
is this business a business that really need that little buffer to, to, to um, cushion it and take it through the current environment? And if we feel, well, based on our analysis, which we look at everything in terms of forecast, past history, collateral, et cetera, if we are comfortable with those metrics, along with the management team, which is really the crooks of the matter from a credit point of view, at the end of the day, we really invest in people and the capacity of a, a team to execute and manage a business correctly. Um, then we will structure a credit deal that will have a customized solution, i.e. it might be preference shares, it might be a, a loan that have um, profit upside so that now they have a very low coupon or a coupon that is um, probably even a cream, a cretin now, and then pay us in um, one year time when the, as a business um, pick up and so forth. So we, in deploying capital right now, we are very um, cautious, but at the same time, we are finding companies that have good platform, good asset base, good um, um, business models. It's just that they are going through a, a very a contracted economy because of the pandemic. And um, But we believe in the leadership team of those business to take the business through. Um, my final answer to that as well is that what, I, what we have found out is that you know, there are businesses in our portfolio right now that had entered the pandemic with strong cash flow, uh, well, with strong war chest, so to speak. So when the current environment affected um, other players in their industry, their strategy was to expand their business by acquiring um, entities. So in that scenario, we will sit with them and understand fully what is the plan and then again create a solution to help them to execute that um that that opportunity okay um there are also business that we and quite frankly that we had to provide working capital support to because again as i said sometime um a business in distribution you know they, if the if sales fall and inventory is stuck not moving uh, mm -hmm. but this is a good business good leadership team um and you are secure of a good line of sight of how the business operate. Um, you, you, you know, the alternatives, the demand of alternative investors like us is to support medium sized firms to really weather shocks in the environment. Okay. okay. So there must be some nimbleness in the, in the deployment plan as well, then, is, is what you're guiding people to say. Fine. Right. Thank All you right. very much for that. Thank you very much for that. Um, thank you, Barris. Excellent presentation. Very insightful and a testimonial of, of how to raise and deploy additional capital. Certainly supports um, Dr. Lawrence's uh, point. I'm now, uh, thank you again, and I'm now going to um, hand over to our next presenter, the none other than the Honorable Michael Leachin, who by himself needs no introduction, but uh, certainly um, a man of this stature, is certainly we need to follow the proper protocols and give him the, the due recognition. And um, um, Mr. Honorable Michael Leachin certainly is the entrepreneur with the philosophy of doing well and doing good, has resulted in extraordinary business success and inspirational philanthropic initiatives. As the, um, as the, as Portland Holding is a privately held investment company um, that manages public and private equity. Mr. Leachin has had an ownership interest in a collection of diversified businesses operating in various countries and across numerous sectors, including financial services, insurance, media, tourism, agriculture, real estate, and um, targeted radionuclide in, uh, therapy. Among his personal accomplishments is that Mr. Leachin has received a Doctor of Laws degrees from a number of distinguished universities in Canada and the Caribbean, and in 2008 was awarded one of Jamaica's highest national honors, that of Order of Jamaica, for his significant contributions in business and philanthropy. In 2011-2016, 
Dr. Mr. Leachin served as Chancellor of the Wilfrid Laurier University. In 2016, he was appointed Chair of the Government's Economic Growth Council, EGC, e in an effort to bolster economic development. He was also appointed the Order of Ontario in 2018, the province's highest honor reserved for those whose contributions have shaped the province, the country, and beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Honorable Michael Leachin to make his presentation. Welcome, sir. All right, um, Andre Neville here. Let's give us a few minutes and um, we'll have him on for you. Okay. All right. Um, in the interim, is I, I, I think there was another question um, in the chat. Uh, yes, Beris, I want to know if you could manage this one. It's what are the steps to be taken to prepare a company to raise capital? Uh, sure. Sure, Andre. Uh, Uh, sure. Um, well, the, the, the key step to, well, it depends. Let me start by saying, well, if you are doing an IPO, the steps are a little bit different than if you are doing an APO. Um, but fundamentally, one of the first steps to undertake is to, upon, assuming that a company already look at its governance strategy or its governance um, setup where you have a proper board in place, um, you have proper accounting and operational processes in place, right? So you, you, those are a big, th th those are some work you have to start maybe a year or two before you actually start thinking about going public. You have to ensure that you put proper accounting um, system and management in place, a proper board. In terms of the actual capital markets efforts, the first thing to do is to appoint a reputable broker. Uh, you call that broker a lead arranger or a lead broker. And that broker will then pull together a team, including attorneys, et cetera, to pull together the prospectus, help you write the prospectus, um, analyze the value of the business. They will then take you on a road show, which is basically presenting your business to um, potential investors to let they understand the business. And you know, once the transaction goes through the regulator process, i.e., the Jamaica Stock Exchange, the um, Financial Services Commission, Companies Office, etc., then your lead broker will launch the transaction and. Um, um, engage in the sales process with both institutional and um, individual investors. But so it's the first step in the capital markets activity is to appoint a good lead broker or, or lead arranger. Okay. What about private capital? Um, we're not talking IPO or APO here, now, but private capital. Yeah, private capital is a is little bit easier. Uh, well, let me say the, 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 the process is a little bit easier from a disclosure point of view, but the effort is the same. You have to, again, have a business that is put together from a, a financial accounting point of view, uh, a decent, a good board. And then once you appoint a lead broker, your lead broker will help you to write an information memorandum. They will then... Um, Register it with the with the with the uh, uh, register the transaction with the um, financial services commission under what you call the exempt distribution guideline, and then they will do a roadshow, which is normally even more extensive, so to speak, than in terms of meeting and drilling down with institutional high net worth investors who are accredited investors. There are some limits in in terms of private okay. placement, and okay. and and. They will manage that process for you. Again, a lead yes. broker, the right lead broker, lead arranger will um, basically navigate you through the okay. private placement. Okay, all right. Thank you very much, Beris. Uh, 
Mr. Lee Chen, I see that you've joined us now. Um, um, so I'm going to hand over to Honorable Michael Lee Chin. Happy to have you, sir. Over to you. Just unmute there. Good afternoon, Francis. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm happy to be here. Happy to uh, have you, sir. Happy to have you. Thank you. So, uh, is should I just start off my presentation, Francis, or are uh, Francis? Uh, you 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 may you may go ahead, sir. Um, okay. You, go ahead. you know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, do you guys know? what a unicorn is? Well, it's a Greek, a rare Greek mythological beast. When was the last time you've seen a unicorn? Probably never. That's, that's how rare it is. Well, a unicorn in business is also equally rare. Very few people, very few business people, very few, anybody, has ever, has ever seen one, very few. And a unicorn in business is defined as a private business that has exceeded a valuation of 1 billion US dollars. That's a unicorn in business. Most, in fact, every business should aspire to be a unicorn, every business. If you don't, because you're just saying, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it with amazing accuracy. So if you, uh, it, so, so every business, as I said, should aspire to be a unicorn. Very few do achieve it. Now, I have been fortunate that I have, be, I have not only been associated with one unicorn, but not two, not three, but four private businesses uh, that have exceeded a valuation of one, more than one billion US and two publicly traded businesses that, have exceed, that are now multi-billion dollar publicly traded businesses, which would include NCB. NCB I don't cl classify as a unicorn because it's public. So in effect, Portland Holdings, my holding company, has been associated with four privately, private businesses that have exceeded valuation of greater than one billion and two public companies. Now, these businesses were in geographical locations as far and wide as Canada, Australia, Germany, uh, uh, the, 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 the Central America and the Caribbean, uh, and in different sectors that would encompass asset management, uh, asset management, uh, independent power production, uh, targeted radionuclide therapy, uh, what else? Telecommunications, and you'd know a couple of them, Telecommunications Columbus. Asset management was AIC, banking, NCB. So, so what I'm saying, the question really is, how did this happen? What is it? Since it is so rare to be associated with one, what did you do to, what are you guys doing at Portland to be associated with four unicorns plus two multi-billion dollar US valuation businesses? What are you doing? What have you done? What did you do? Well, Warren Buffett once said, what I do is simple, not easy. So I'm gonna talk about the framework that we used to have, uh, uh, to, to have this outcome I just mentioned. So all the unicorn, uh, and by the way, by the way, guys, do you know what a herd of unicorn is called? It's called a blessing, and it's true. It's a blessing, uh, and that's why I'm not being funny. You Google it. A herd of unicorn is a blessing. 
So the question really is, I'm not here to brag, or the point is, I'm not here to brag about the, 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 tr the track record. I just want to point out the track record and because it begs the question, how was it done? And what can we learn from the framework, the process that uh, was utilized to have achieved this outcome? Firstly, Warren Buffett famously said when he was asked, how come you're such a great capital allocator? He said, I'm a better investor because I'm a businessman. And conversely, I'm a better businessman because I'm an investor. All of us on this call, all of us aspirants, unicorn aspirants, right? We are both investors and business people. We're investing in our, our, our company. And we're also managing, or managing our company. So we are both investors and also operators of businesses. So, the, so let us talk a little bit about what, it, what are the characteristics of a great investor? Because all of us in this, on this call, we are investors. So we may as well know what the characteristics are to make us a great investor. Firstly, a great investor owns a few, not too many, high quality businesses. Secondly, a great invest, a great investors really understand what they own. The hallmark of investing is understand what you own. Great investors make sure that what they own are domiciled in strong long-term growth industries. Thirdly, fourthly, great investors use other people's money prudently. And fifthly, great investors, their attitude towards ownership is for as long as this business that I'm investing in remains a great business, I'm going to hold it. So it could be generational for as long as, as it remains great businesses. So I've encompassed those five principles uh, in what I call the five laws of wealth creation pertaining to investors. So we are all investors here. So those five principles, if we don't heed them, they're gonna come back to haunt us. Not heeding them will come back to haunt us. Heeding them will over time create a lot of wealth. Secondly, what, how did we do it? Let's talk now about the characteristics of the businesses that we are associated with. Number one, and there are 10. Number one, these businesses are run by owner operators. In fact, just to make it uh, tactile for all of us on the, on the call here, think about a very successful uh, wealthy person. And I'm gonna describe the 10 characteristics of, that, of the business that is owned by that very successful wealthy person. Number one, that wealthy person you're thinking of owns a business that is run by, he, he or she is actually the owner operator. Number one characteristic. So wealth creating businesses are run by owner operators. Number two, that business that is owned by the wealth creator that you're thinking of uh, has, is owned by a few Shareholders, there's heavy concentration of the ownership of that business, that wealth creating business. Thirdly, the third characteristics, characteristic of wealth creating businesses would be the key, there, the key stakeholders, there's personal identification between the owners of the business, owner operators of the business, and the business, personal identification, and the business and the owners. So give you an example. When you think about Apple, whose face comes to mind? Steve Jobs. When you think of Steve Jobs, which business comes to mind? Apple. So there's personal identification between the owner and the business and the business and the owner. And a key characteristic 
of wealth creating businesses. Fourthly, wealth creating businesses are not run by, by decisions are not made in a democratic way. Invariably, the decisions are made in an autocratic way, invariably. Fifthly, wealth creating businesses are entrepreneurial in their management style. Sixthly, they have low turnover of management. Seventhly, periodically when these businesses create, uh, make a profit, the profit has to be allocated. If the capital allocation is a good one, the net worth of the business, the equity of the business increases. If it's a bad one, the equity decreases. So the risk reward uh, for capital allocation is perfectly symmetrical. The metaphor will be flip a coin, heads, the business wins, tails, the business loses, pertaining to capital allocation. The eighth characteristic characteristics of wealth creating businesses is that they think long term. Ninthly, the focus of the owner operators is singular growth, growth, growth. The tenth characteristic is validation of success would be a function of market share, margins, revenue growth, profitability, customer satisfaction. So those 10 characteristics uh, are the characteristics that define wealth creating businesses. So if you, you know what they are, all we have to do is keep those 10 characteristics as your checklist and then make sure that every day you look at a checklist and you, you, you make sure that you're on side of those 10 characteristics. Now, I go through that framework because once you know what you stand for, you can always know it, it, it will, when decisions are to be made, you know what is for you and what is not for you. So let me give you, let me know, let me know superimpose against those 10 characteristics, the character, the equivalent characteristics of the, your typical publicly traded business. Remember I said the first characteristic of wealth creating business is that they're run by owner operators. Your typical public company, there's a separation between the owners and the operators, separation between management and shareholders. And that's where the problem starts, because what you now have, uh, when you have a separation of the owners from the operators, you now have to, to maintain order in the business, you now have to interpose a corporate governance structure, which starts off with the board of directors. But the board of directors, they don't need to be owners. They're agents. And who are they supervising? Management. Management doesn't need to own. Management are also agents. So you have agents on top of agents, supervising agents, you have agency risk squared, right? So that's a first departure of your typical public company from wealth creating businesses. Secondly, your typical public company, the ownership is dispersed. Thirdly, which is again opposite to your wealth creating business. The third char characteristic is the, your typical public company, you cannot put a face to the ownership invariably. You think of uh, any large public company, except for NCB, right? It's very difficult to put a face to the company. But wealth creating businesses, you can put a face to them. Fourthly, in your typical public company, because of corporate governance and what they call best of class corporate governance, it's, a, it's, run, by, it's run in a perfectly democratic manner versus your wealth creating business is not. Fifthly, your typical public company uh, is not entrepreneurial in its management style. It's invariably bureaucratic because the first concentric circle of responsibility staff management has is don't lose your job. Therefore, bureaucracies, bureaucracies are built. Sixthly, which is like, again, the opposite of wealth creating business. Sixthly, wealth creating business at low turnover management 
public, typical public company, not so much in Jamaica, but it's in North America, high turnover of management. Your average CEO in North America lasts three and a half years. You know, wealth creating big private business, 35 years. Seventhly, periodically when, uh, when for a public company, when a, cap a profit is made, the profit has to be allocated. If it's a good allocation, management gets a bonus. If it's a bad allocation, management gets half the bonus. If it's a really ugly allocation, management gets a golden parachute. It's tantamount to flip a coin, heads management wins, tails management does not lose. If your typical public company uh, the, 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 uh, is run what, based on quarterly earnings, quarterly earnings are important and guidance is usually, uh, the, the decisions are made based on quarterly earnings versus your wealth creating private business, the early, the, there's no quarterly pressures. So lo, is long term is much is the tenure of how do, uh, decisions are made. Ninthly, the ninth comparison between your typical public company and wealth creating business would be uh, whereby the focus of the own operator in a private business is growth, growth, growth. In your typical public company, it's the opposite. It's risk and compliance. That's what they focus on. And lastly, validation of success would be, would be marked market or stock price. So you can see that once you realize, once you have codified, as I have, as we have here, the characteristics of wealth creating businesses, you can now measure any uh, measure any business, public or private, against those characteristics to see how many of the ten characteristics really are relevant. And invariably, at the extreme, your, your, your typical public company it would be the opposite of those 10 characteristics. Now, the reason for me being here is to go through with you how you can make your business a unicorn. So I, I started off by saying uh, unicorns are private businesses that are valued at a billion dollars. So how would you make your business a unicorn? The first thing you have to do is ask yourself, what, would, what do I have to do? What, what, do? what does my business have to do for it to be valued at 1 billion US dollars? Well, firstly, we need to find a relevant valuation metric for your business. So if your business is, is say in the manufacturing business, we have to find out how manufacturing businesses are valued. So what you do, you go on this on a stock exchange and look home through the exchange. The Jamaica stock, stock exchange may not have an equivalent, but you go to a larger stock exchange to see what the, the relevant metric would be for a business that is publicly traded that's similar to yours. So once you define the characteristics of your business, the industry, you know, go and find a similarly traded business on an exchange, whether in the New York Stock Exchange or the Toronto Stock Exchange or the FTSE. And what you're looking for is a relevant valuation metric. And to be the most simple one would be price earnings ratio, C. So you may say, you may see that in New York and Toronto, London, the, the, the price earnings ratio uh, for a business similar to yours clusters at around 10, 10 times earnings. So you know that your business, for it to be a billion dollar business, you have to have uh, earnings of $100 million, right? Because 10 times 100 million, a billion, okay? So the question now is, once you've done that is, how am I gonna get my earnings up to $100 million US? So that will force you to start thinking, and by the way, 10 times earnings, that is for if your, your business was public. But if, given that it is private, you have to apply an illiquidity discount to that 10 times earnings. And the illiquidity discount may range from 25 to 40%. Let us say it's 25%. So your business, as a private business, won't be 10 times earnings because once after you have applied it, the illiquidity discount, it will be, if it's applying a discount of 25%, it will be 7.5 times earnings, okay? 
So you'll have to earn uh, how much? Over 100 million, 120 million, say, to be worth a billion dollars at 7.5 times earnings. So the question now is, how are you going to earn 120 million? Uh, with, how is your business going to earn 120 million? Once you start, once you have a target, then you can now think about margins, revenues, uh, growth, uh, and whether or not in your jurisdiction that's possible to earn 120 million. And if it's not, then you may have to say, okay, what's my next concentric circle? I have to go regional. Right, and you, you you see whether or not you can your business, given market share, market size, can really get to one hundred and twenty million dollars. If not, you may have to be thinking, well, I can't do it in Jamaica, I can't do it in the Caribbean. I have to go beyond the shores. So it guides having that goal of uh, knowing knowing what your relevant financial metric is, valuation metric is. Hence, you can figure out what your earnings need to be. And you put a time frame on it, say seven years from now, I need to get to 120 million and my business will be a US in earnings and my business will be a unicorn. So it now guides you having that goal, earnings goal, it guides you as to uh, market, as to your markets. It gu also guides you to think about whether or not man the management that you have is capable of taking you there. So that process of starting off with valuation and then working back to what you have to do today to build up a business with those 10 characteristics I mentioned, that's how you go about building your own unicorn. Francis, that's my story, sir. Um. It's actually Andre Gooden, sir. But... Andre. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Um, very insightful as usual. Very exciting. All our present presenters today have brought us excellent stories, excellent perspectives. Um, oh, one thing that jumped out at me is uh, where you said that the wealth creating businesses are autocracies uh, in terms of decision making. Uh, you have found that to be so globally or in Jamaica, or is that a, a universal trend for you in terms of how your businesses operate? Well, uh, again, Andre, think about any wealthy person, right? On, all I did to have was observe wealthy people and wealth, wealth creating businesses. And those five characteristics that are, are, are relevant to the investor, that the five laws I mentioned initially, and the 10 characteristics that are relevant to the business, they all came from observations. So if you think about a wealthy person, any wealthy person, for instance, Mr. Stewart, the, form, the recently deceased Mr. Butch Stewart, right? And you think about sandals, right? That's a wealth creating business. And sandals would hit all of those 10 characteristics, right, of, of the business, starting with he's an own operator. Mr. Butch Stewart. Right. Uh, no, Adam is an owner operator. And we just go down the list and you see uh, he, the sandals would have 10 tick marks against those criteria, right? Uh, so it's, it's, all, it's all, we cannot, unless we are conscious, unless we codify, unless we codify uh, the behavior and the characteristics, it's not just going to follow to the ear and happen. We have to codify and work towards them. So we have to emulate people who have done it. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. And that is the that is the the, the moral of the story is go with the tried and unproven strategies. Um, uh, how, how does one decide? I mean, there there are many many companies online now, sir, who are looking to come to the market um, <clears throat> with with equity. Um, who are, some may be leveraged heavily in, in terms of debt. Um, going back to the question that uh, Beris had a perspective on the answer, um, what is the first call having raised the, the, the cash on the market in terms of deployment 
where would death rank? I mean, there are other elements, of course, um, which would be uh, inventory, um, et cetera, et cetera. But where would you rank uh, paying off debt as the alternative, having raised the capital? Just a question that comes to us a lot. Well, remember, okay, remember, well, it is going back to every time you, a question is posed, I always go back to my framework. That's the importance of having frameworks. Because frameworks guide you. So the question is, where would debt rank once, re, once equity is raised? Uh, remember what you're trying to do. You're trying to build a high quality. We're all trying to build a high quality business. business. Number one, as investors, because we're, 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 we're all investors in our own business. So we want our business the investment that we make, which is our own business, to be of a high quality. Number two, we have to make sure that we understand it. I'm going back to the five laws. Number three, we have to make sure we use other people's money prudently. And number four, we have to make sure that the business we're in have long-term growth characteristics. It would be in a strong long-term growth industry. And number five, it, we have to be prepared to hold it for the long run. So that's the framework I'm going to use to answer the question. So the question is, where does would debt rank, paying off debt rank? Again, law number three, you have to use debt prudently. Right. So if you're over, over leveraged, then you have, you, have you, you know, you have to look at the relevant valuation uh, coverage ratio for your own industry, right? And just keep within your, your coverage ratio. But at the extreme, you don't want to pay off debt because debt is what give, gives you leverage, right? And if your return on equity is greater than the cost of your, your financing, then you're fine, right? So I have always lived with debt. Debt is what creates wealth because it, it increases your leverage and your return on equity. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Excellent, ex excellent presentation once again. And um, we thank you for the time. We have run over time a little bit, but certainly if there are any questions, put them in the chat and we will address them uh, after. Um, but again, thank you, sir. And um, I will ask Tracy and Spence, Chief Operating Officer on NCB Capital Markets to move the official vote of thanks. Over to you, Tracy. Thanks, Andre. Hearing me? Okay, yes, great. we are, yes, yes. Pleasant good morning, everyone, all protocols observed. So there is no better timing for this morning's topic than now. Jamaica has by no means been spared the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Almost every business has had to pivot, the new pandemic buzzword. But implicit in pivoting is restructuring, restoring, and renewing. And this is why I believe this webinar and its theme are very timely. In 2019, the stock exchange main market saw seven new listings, while the junior market had six. 2020 was well on its way to a continued active market, kickstarted by NROC sale of shares in Trans Jamaica, and then COVID hit. We didn't see any capital raise activity again until the summer. Understandably so, market uncertainty resulted in a pause and pullback in capital raise activity. Barris mentioned this, and Dr. Williams gave us some insights into the pandemic's impact on company performance, the market, and the economy. The reality is, though, that in order for businesses to truly pivot, or rather renew, restore, and restructure, they will require capital support. Institutions like Cygnus realized this and successfully approached the market in the latter part of 2020, including Cygnus over $8 billion has been raised on the market since December 2020, highlighting that expansion during a pandemic is indeed possible. Beris, thank you for sharing your perspective on why you decided to approach the market in spite of, and NCB Capital Markets was very happy to have assisted as co-broker. As a member of Jamaica's leading brokerage firm, the privilege is mine to represent my industry colleagues in lauding the stock, Jamaica Stock Exchange, investment firms, investee companies, regulators, and investors who continue to dare greatly despite the challenges of present day. I believe we all should understand the importance of grooming a market to withstand shocks and know the role that equity capital plays in long-term growth and innovation. 
Marlene understands this clearly. And I thank her for her continued boldness in raising the bar where market development is concerned. As she reminded us, equity capital allows for agility and it is extremely important that we take advantage of the resources available to us. As strategists, researchers, and investment managers, we must use data in ways that are guided by best practices and seek solutions geared towards making informed decisions. Dr. Lawrence, thank you for an excellent and informative presentation. Your work highlighted that equity is an underutilized means of raising capital, yet the benefits to be derived are far reaching. I've had the pleasure of working with Dr. Lawrence in both a professional capacity and as a student of his, so I can attest to his work. My fellow co colleagues, opportunities abound. The data speaks for itself. Stop leaving money on the table. The Honorable Michael Leachin, or Chairman, as he's affectionately called at the NCB Financial Group, it's always a pleasure to hear you speak. We are guaranteed to leave with some gems. So I hope everybody took notes of the five laws of wealth creation, as well as the 10 characteristics of creating, of a wealth creating business, and importantly, how to create your own unicorn. Colleagues, you have heard the prospective presentations, themes, and charges emerging from each. And as such, the road to recovery might seem like a long one, but it doesn't have to be lonely. Let us now galvanize support among ourselves, have customer centricity, both the supply and demand side as our core focus, and go boldly in reconditioning, restructuring, and reigniting our market. Jamaica, pandemic or not, is our home, our place to build. We are the ones with the ideas, the vehicles to drive change, and importantly, the resources to change market conditions. Let us continue to identify those opportunities that provide growth. As COO of NCB Capital Markets, I am giving my company's commitment to building a better Jamaica by continuing to provide assistance to companies seeking to raise capital, as well as providing financial advice on how best to deploy that capital. We support on both the demand and the supply side. We recently launched our suite of alternative investment funds, Stratos, as a part of such efforts. Stratos will see NCB Capital Markets expanding our vehicles through which we can assist companies with capital support. So listen out, look out, we'll be reaching out for one-on-one -on -one consultations. And I know we have the support of the Honorable Michael Leachin for such discussions. We stand ready to work with the stock exchange and the market in creating future unicorns and public, the public versions of such unicorns. Thank you so much for joining this morning and thank you for choosing to be a part of this timely and useful webinar hosted by the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Have a great rest of the day, everyone. Thank you very much, Tracy. And in closing, I would just want to thank the NCB Capital Markets for being our partner in this initiative. Thank you all very much. And thank you for your all 140 other for your attention for the last two hours and have a wonderful day. Thank you very much.